Hey guys, today I'm going to show you how to uh, create Zelda, okay, as one of your 494 template games. So the first thing we want to do is notice we're kind of starting with what Jeremy has created uh, in terms of his technology for uh, parsing maps, turning them into tiles, uh, for example, map, uh, turning them into a tile, tile sheet, and uh, generating a map for that, okay? Jeremy has a wonderful explanation of how this works in his Metroid tutorial, and if you want to know how it works, I will uh, defer you to that. However, as it stands right now, we have exactly this. Let's run our game. As you can see, uh, Jeremy's kind of tiling technology has been set up to work with the dungeon map for the first dungeon of The Legend of Zelda. Okay? And you can see that as the camera moves around, it loads in uh, the rest of the dungeon. All the tiles, all the rooms, and that each individual tile is selectable and can be altered by you. For instance, look how we're just getting rid of these blocks and stuff. Cool. See? Now this is great. But now we need to actually start adding game-like elements. We just don't want to look at the environment. So the first thing you should do is you should go to the Spriter's resource and you would uh, grab Link Sprites, for instance. I've already downloaded them for you. So if you look at this, uh, you'll see that you have a kind of uh, image asset. It has been set to the Sprite mode, so that's the kind of texture it is. You'll see that this texture represents multiple sprites and that uh, the pixels per unit has been set to 16. Very important. Otherwise, everything will be scaled improperly. If you go into Sprite Editor, it will open up a window where you can see how each sprite is kind of broken down. Okay? So let's add Link to our scene. Okay? You can do that by simply going to Link Sprites over here in your uh, project folder, going Link Sprites 0, and dragging it into your hierarchy. You can double click on it to find it then. Hey, there's Link, right at 000. Cool. So let's go ahead and rename him. Not is he not only is he just the first kind of um, frame of the animation, he's in fact going to be our link object. So we re rename him we rename him uh, to fit that. So go ahead and take Link and drag him into your prefabs folder. Uh, that will actually create him as a prefab. So now, if we want to instantiate a bunch of links, we can do so. Ta-da. But we don't want that. Cool, so let's play the game. You can see that Link is hidden right now, right? He's nowhere to be found. Where could he be, I wonder? Well, as it turns out, Link is actually, uh, the first room in the map is actually a little bit over here. So what we really need to do is we need to move Link to make sure that he is where he should be at the start of the game. So if we move him over here, then we can get him to the exact spot we want him in to start the game. What you'll also notice is that Link himself kind of falls un uh, under, you know, behind the tiles that make up the dungeon. Okay? So it's called Z fighting. You have two objects that are at the exact same Z value. See, they're all they're they're at zero. And so the uh, engine doesn't really know which one you you know you would want it to draw. So it kind of flickers pieces of them in and out. To resolve this, we can simply go to our sprite render for our link object, and we can say the order and layer is one. That tells the engine that, yes, we definitely want to draw this uh, after we draw the background so that Link is always visible. So we'll end the game, and then we'll make sure that those changes are reflected, okay? So 40, 1.5, and 0. 40, 1.5, and 0. And then we can't uh, forget to set the order and layer to 1. Now when we start the game, we should expect to get uh, good behavior, and that we should see Link. 
Hey, and there he is. Not bad. We might move him over just a little bit. Let's try that again. Just a little bit more. 39.5. <coughs> Good. Looks great. Iteration is really quick uh, in Unity. So there we go. Uh, All right, here we are looking into the link movement script, the kind of guts of our link movement component. Uh, what we need to think about is how do we get the input from our player. Now, Unity provides a nice class called input uh, that can allow us to do just that. And with it comes a function called getAxis. Now, an axis is basically just a way of thinking about and, and uh, analyzing a controller and, and what state it's in. So, for example, if we grab the horizontal axis, then we can learn all about what horizontal inputs are pressed. For example, the left and right arrow keys. So we're going to print out that value and just verify it's what we expect. It's printing 0 now when you hold nothing down. If you hold the right key down, you'll see it go toward 1. If you hold the left key down, you'll see the value head toward negative 1. That's what we expect. Now we need to take that value that's coming in through the input and we need to turn it into movement for link. So we need to store it. So go ahead and store it. We also need to store the value for the vertical axis. And once we have these two things, we can put them into a nice vector 3 that's going to act as our velocity. In fact, let's call it new velocity. This last component of the new velocity vector 3, this z component, is 0. If you wonder why, all you must do is think about how does Link move in game. Well, he moves side to side, that's the x-axis we can see. He moves up and down, that's the y-axis. But in the game, he never moves inward and outward of the camera. That's the z-axis. So we can basically ignore that one, and in the code, we do. Just leave it as a zero. Now what we need to do is we need to take this new velocity vector, and we need to apply it to the physics of Link, the Link game object. However, the Link game object doesn't have any physics related components. It has transform, it has sprite render, and our Link movement script. In order to give Link some real physical properties, we have to add the rigid body component. Rigid body is in physics right here, right next to the colliders and the joints. Go ahead and add a rigid body. You can see that by adding this rigid body component, our link object has gained the physical properties mass, drag, angular drag, in case you're spinning, and even gravity. Let's see what happens now that he has these properties. He falls, right? Because he has gravity now. Let's remove gravity and just be sure that he doesn't fall. That's what happens. Now that link has a rigid body, you know, physics related component, we can get that component and once we have that component with this get component function we can grab its velocity property and we can set it to our new computed velocity that is based on our inputs let's see what happens hey he's moving that's a pretty good start right Unfortunately, if you look at Link's movement, there are a lot of things wrong with it. First, Link shouldn't be able to move diagonally. We need to fix that. Go back into your script, and right in the middle of these two blocks, we're going to put a conditional statement. We're going to say, if there is horizontal movement, then our vertical movement should not exist. 
if we are moving horizontally at all, make sure we're not moving vertically. If we go back and test our program, we'll see that this is now the case. Link can no longer move diagonally, so a step in the right direction. He's very slow though, so let's go back into our code and add a public float velocity factor. And let's set it equal to the default of 1.0. This velocity factor is going to magnify the final velocity that gets put into the rigid body for Link. This will allow us to adjust while the game runs the movement speed of Link. He's the same speed now, but notice that we have a new property, the velocity factor. Set it to something like 3.5 and watch as Link speeds right up. There he goes. Notice how once the game ended, the velocity factor value that we had set during gameplay set back to 1. That will always happen, so make sure you don't forget to set things back to their desired value after the game ends. That way they'll, they'll stick. The last thing we need to do is we need to address this acceleration and deceleration. That's not the way it should be. It's definitely not authentic. So go up to Edit, Project Settings, and Input. Here you can see all the axes, right? In fact, the horizontal axis and the vertical axis are the same ones that we pulled back in our code. You can go ahead and examine their properties. So if you look through here, you'll notice that, hey, the left and the right arrow keys are what the negative and positive buttons are. They correspond to negative one and positive one, respectively. But you might not have noticed that A and D do as well. They're the alternate buttons. If you look at gravity, you'll notice that it controls how quickly the value for the axis falls to zero when you're not pressing anything. Ideally, we want this uh, to be very, very fast so that there's no visible deceleration. Sensitivity is, uh, is opposite to this. When you're holding an arrow key, this controls how quickly you'll get up to top speed. So go ahead and make that very large too and go ahead and make those changes reflect in the vertical axis as well. Now play the game. Looks a whole lot better, doesn't it? You'll need to do some measurements and play the original game to find the exact speed at which Link should move and play around with some settings in Unity. You'll also need to figure out how to make grid, uh, grid movement possible how to make Link move only on a grid, and enemies only on a grid. Right now, Link can go anywhere in this space, but in Zelda, if you look carefully, there's actually a subgrid of possible positions that Link can be in, and that's a very important mechanism for making it easy to get through doorways and line up with certain items, and you'll need to replicate it. But this is a pretty good start. If you play the game and run around a little bit, you may notice something off. Link should be colliding with all of those blue statues, but he's going right over it. What gives? I mean, Link does have a rigid body, right? That should give him physical properties. Shouldn't he collide? Well, in fact, the answer is no. You see, if you look at both objects, both Link with his rigid body and the blue statue tile, with his box collider, you'll see that Link also needs a box collider as well. In fact, things won't collide unless they have colliders. So, while this blue thing has a box collider, Link needs one too. So let's go ahead and add one. And then continue playing the game. Or just exit. Exit and add the box collider to Link's prefab. Good, now Link has a nice box collider. So, what is going to happen when we play the game now? Well, nothing is going to happen. You see, if you look at both objects now, Link has a box collider and it's enabled. But, 
The blue statue has a box collider that is disabled. Why was it disabled? Well, when it comes to Jeremy's really cool tiling tech, it uses a file, if you look down here in the project structure, called collision. As you can see, it's just a bunch of dashes. Well, this collision file actually maps to the sprite map, your collection of tiles. It informs the tiling system about what tiles are physical, what tiles need to have their box colliders turned on. So, for instance, if we were to open up the collision file and open up the sprite map image, we might decide that these two statues here on the left need to be made solid. So you would see that they're in the third row, they're in the third and fourth columns, and you would go in and you would put two S's there. These S's respond to these two statues. This will inform the system, don't, don't forget to save, this will inform the system that if it sees those two tiles, it needs to turn on the uh, box colliders for those tiles. Let's see if we collide. We do. Good. If you go into the tile uh, script and you look toward the bottom, you'll see that case, that S character, and what happens when it sees an S. Basically, it doesn't do a whole lot, but if it sees a dash, then it will turn the box collider off. You can use this function right here and customize it to add your own properties to certain tiles and to create your own logic for making tiles interesting or unique, perhaps even pushable in Legend of Zelda fashion. If you go back and play the game, it's pretty cool. You've got collisions now, as you'd expect, but something isn't quite right. In fact, if you collide in certain ways, it appears Link is a bit drunk. That's no way to go through a dungeon, son. What you should do is you should want a way to restrain Link, to make sure that he cannot spin. If you look at the object and look at the rigid body, you'll notice a section called constraints that allow you to freeze position, freeze rotation. Well, we want to freeze all of our rotation. We never want to rotate, to be honest with you. So go ahead and freeze it. You'll notice that the spinning stops. You'll want to freeze your position, too, because, like we said earlier, Link should only ever have one Z value. He should not go back and forth through, uh, you know, from the camera. It might mess up collisions if that ever happens. So turn off your game and make sure that these changes stick. Now let's test it and make sure that we can't have Drunk Link. Good. It seems to work well. If you can't tell, I'm trying to go to the right. And if there was a grid system, I would be able to very easily. That is the point of the grid system, in fact. To make it easy to go through these physical things. To line up perfectly. Collisions are now looking much, much better. Make sure you fill out that collision.txt so that all the solid wall tiles, for instance, are colliding as well. Go ahead and do that now. The game now has reasonable collisions, but it still doesn't look all that interesting, and it certainly doesn't look very dynamic or animated. So that's what we should do next. We should do some animating. Link should be able to walk around and you know, walk up, walk to the right, walk left, walk down. So we need to do some animating. So go ahead and go to the window option, go to animation to bring up the animation pane. Get some stuff out of the way. So what we're going to do is we're going to say we're going to create a new folder called animations. And after we do that, we're going to go into animations 
and we're going to create an animation. Let's call this one link run right. So now that you have that, click on link and you'll see that in the animation pane, uh, actually, so forget that I, we created that later, that uh, let's, let's just delete that animation we just made. So click on link, look at the animation pane, it will give you the option to create an animation clip. Go ahead and do so. Put it into the animation folder and call it link run right. You'll see that everything has turned red, including the play buttons up here. That basically means that if you make changes to that object, link, it will be recorded on this timeline right here. So the first change we're going to make, since we're trying to make him run right, is we're going to go into his sprite property in the sprite render, and we're going to give him a new image, link sprites 3. You can see that by doing this, Link has changed his image, and the animation window has taken note of this. It's recording the changes you make so that it can replay them later as an animation. What you're going to want to do is you're going to want to advance the timeline a little bit. And then you're going to make another change. You're going to find the next sprite in the series. So, a Link standing. That way, when you bounce back and forth, it's very obvious that Link is animating. And that is the walking animation. It's not going to look very good because we spend uh, this interval in the kind of split legs uh, running stance and then just a quick frame in the standing stance. So we need to add one more and we're going to go back to his running stance. Now if you play this, you can see that it's animating pretty darn well. It looks decent. We also need a running upward animation. So go ahead and create a new clip. Call it link run upward. We're going to do the same thing. Send your timeline all the way back to zero. Click on your object link and give him the first sprite in the series. Right there. Move your timeline on, over a little bit and then give him a new image. Move it over once more and give him the first image to complete the animation. See? Not bad. So now that we have these two animations, and I'm only going to do two, I'll leave the down and the left up to you, we need a way to actually make these happen in game. After all, if we don't start actually playing them, then, well, we can't control them. Link is running as it is right now, but that's not exactly what we want. It does look natural though if he's going side to side. So what we need to do is we need to notice that Link has gotten a new component. He's gotten the animator component. These animations that we have just created, they're just really data. You know, there's nothing that will actually apply them. The animator is responsible for applying them. Uh, the animations don't apply themselves. So if we go and close the animation pane, we can open up a separate animator pane. If you look at the animator pane, there's basically a state machine. If you were wondering why Link just started running right immediately when the game started, this finite state machine explains why. On entry, or on start of this program, 
It transitioned into link run run write, and it never went anywhere else. What we really want is we want to be able to go into link run upward if our velocity is positive in the y direction, and we want to go into link run right if our velocity is positive in the x direction. So what we can do is we can right click on this any state uh, state, <coughs> and we can make a transition to link run upward. Now we have to specify details of this transition. For example, when should it occur? But to do that, we have to add some properties. There's a whole properties or parameters pane right over here. Go ahead and click the plus button and add a float property. We're going to call it vertical vel for vertical velocity. We're going to create another one called horizontal vel for horizontal velocity. The finite state machine knows about these two properties, so when you click on this transition, if you go to the bottom, it will have what's called a list of conditions. You can add a condition that says we will not enter this transition unless vertical val is greater than zero. You can also do less than, and you can use different properties as well. So that's that transition, but how about to get to link run right? Much the same way, we create a transition, and we add a condition to that transition. Except this time, we want to have that condition relate to horizontal vel instead of vertical vel. If it's greater than zero, we want to transition into link run right. Let's see what happens. Nothing has changed, but that's because we're actually not updating any of the properties in this kind of parameter table. The finite state machine for that handles the animations needs to know what these values are, and right now it just thinks they're zero all the time. Within our code, we need to update those values. We can do so by getting a reference to the animation or the animator uh, component of our object. Once we have that, we can call a function on it. Set float. This allows us to specify the name of our parameter and then set a value for it. So vertical vel, and we will set it to the y component of new velocity. New velocity dot y being our vertical input. We can do the same for horizontal vel. And it corresponds with new velocity.x. Let's see what happens. Good. When you run upward, it animates to show you that. When you run to the right, it animates to show you that. There are lots of ways to make this a little bit smoother, but I'm going to leave that up to you for now. So Link may now walk around the environment and look pretty good doing it, right? It's beginning to look like a Zelda game, but one thing you can't yet do is actually swing your sword. You know, you cannot attack anything in the environment. You can't attack any enemies or anything like that. So, the next thing we need to do is we need to create a sword. Unfortunately, creating a sword is a little bit of a monotonous process, so I went ahead and created some of the assets and code ahead of time. I used one of the sprites within the link sprites uh, sprite sheet, and I turned it into another prefab. Let's take a look at it. Here's the sword. It's just a simple sprite, it has a transform, and that's all it has at this point. It's incredibly simple. However, it needs to be a prefab because we need to be able to instantiate it whenever we go to swing our sword. 
So now that we have the sword prefab, we need to make sure that the link control script actually knows about it. If you go to the link movement script, you'll see that there are some additional new properties. You'll see that one of them is sword prefab. You can go ahead and either click the circle and click the sword, or you can drag the sword prefab straight over there. So now that we have the sword prefab, you'll notice we can walk around, and we can also hit spacebar to swing our sword. Cool. But how does it actually work? If you go into the script, you'll notice a few things that I've added. Notably, there's a new combat function that gets called once per frame. This combat function progresses a sword cooldown. Basically, a cooldown is just a timer that decreases and prevents you from doing things while that timer is still ongoing. In other words, when Link swings his uh, sword, uh, he will not be able to move, for instance. As soon as the sword uh, cooldown gets to zero, then we destroy the sword. Make it go away. And if you look at the movement code, Link's movement is being constrained by the sword cooldown. So if the sword is out there, then Link cannot move. Probably the most important line in creating the sword and the sword effect is here. Sword instance equals instantiate sword prefab, which that's the field that we just dragged in in the inspector, remember? We click the circle there and specify the sword for the sword prefab. The transform.position and quaternion.identity. This first field specifies what kind of prefab do we want to instantiate into the world, into the scene. <coughs> the second field specifies where we want to put that sword. In this case, we want to put it right on top of Link. This third uh, argument specifies which angle you want the sword to be facing. We take care of the angle and the position a little bit later, so these are kind of default values. Quaternion.identity is basically a default angle. Next, we need to actually adjust the sword which way it's pointing, and the position of the sword based on which way Link is currently facing. If you watch Link, depending on which way he's facing, the sword will really look different. It'll also move a little bit. The sword is never right on top of Link. So if Link's current direction is north, then we need to move the sword upward a little bit. That's what we do here. If Link is facing east, then we need to move the sword over a little bit in the x-axis, and we need to rotate it 270 degrees to get it over that way, pointing that way. Likewise for facing west and facing south. You might wonder how we know Link's current direction. Well, it happens that we're keeping track of it, right? And when we get our input, then we can tell which way we're facing by analyzing the horizontal input. Is it greater than zero? Then we must be facing east. Is it less than zero? We're facing west. And that's how we can keep track of which direction Link is facing. Last, we have this variable called public game object sword instance. To clarify, that variable, sword instance, is where we're storing the sword that we instantiate into the environment. We destroy it later to make it go away when our cooldown ends. It's pretty simple, but that's how you can create a sword effect. Next, I'll show you how to collide with objects detect those collisions, and react to them. If you're wondering how you can get an enemy to react to this sword, that is how you can do it.
One thing I would like to talk about to kind of wrap things up are collisions. How can you detect collisions between objects? For example, a rupee. How can we detect that Link has come into contact with a rupee? He's got to pick them up, right? We'll have to be able to hit enemies. So this is a pretty important subject. So, as it turns out, um, we can detect the collision of uh, one object with another in code. So we can go ahead and move the rupee near Link. And then we'll have him walk into it. We've got to remember to adjust the order in the layer so that it will show up above the background. <coughs> but now, no collision is happening. If we recall, in order for a collision to occur, we need to have rigid bodies and we need to have colliders. Link has a rigid body and a box collider, so we'll need to put a collider on our rupee. The box collider should do. In our code for link movement, I know it's getting kind of big now. You might want to organize this and separate some of this out. But <coughs> within our script for linked movement, we can create a function called void on collision enter. It takes a parameter, collision, cull. Note that in order for it to work, it has to be absolutely spelled this way, with this parameter as well. That includes the capitalized O, the capitalized C, and the capitalized E. So let's try and detect a collision. Yep, a collision happened. We're colliding with the ruby. In fact, we're also colliding with the blue statue and the walls. Those aren't really things we care to detect, however. The physics system will take care of that for us. So we need a way to differentiate between colliding with the walls and colliding with the ruby. One way to do that is to use the tag system. If you go to a game object and you look in the inspector, you'll find a tag field toward the top. It'll say untagged. We need to create a tag for items, collectible items. So we can add a new tag. Let's call it rupee. Once you create the tag, you simply need to set the rupees tag to be rupee. Now, within our code, in our collision code, we can do a conditional. If cull dot game object, that allows us to get the game object that we collided with, dot tag is equal to rupee, then we're going to print collision, and only then. Good, we got a collision. And if we collide with walls or the blue statues, we don't get one. Good. So a sensible thing to do when you collide with a ruby is to destroy it. You're consuming it, right? So we can go ahead and destroy object. That will destroy the object that we collided with. However, we know that the object we collided with at this point is a rupee. This should destroy the rupee. And there we go. We can collect things now. When you implement collisions with the sword against enemies, or against enemies and link, 
you'll use the same process.